The Father gives us the gift of music to worship him, to remind us of who he is and how he relates to us. And so as we've looked at this music this week, as we prepared for today's worship service, it was felt that there were things surrounding us that were caving in upon us. And we needed to be reminded that we were loved, reminded, to reminded that in Christ alone that our hope is found. We need to be reminded that God is with us. He is our vision. Amen, amen. He's the one who loves us. Yet, while all of that's going on internally in us, at the same time, we're reminded that we get to tell the story of Jesus, how he loves us, how he guides us, how he leads us. So today we're going to go and look at the prophet Joel. So we opened the service this morning with our memory verse from the book of Acts. Peter is actually quoting Joel chapter 2, and that's what we're going to talk about this morning, Joel chapter 2. Because Joel's world and our world, just like the other prophets, are just like ours. Here's our scripture this morning. <clears throat> Joel chapter 2, verses 25 to 29. God is speaking. He says, I will repay you for the years the locusts have eaten. The great locust, the young locust, the other locust, and the locust swarms my great army that I sent upon amongst you. You will have plenty to eat until you are full, and you will praise the name of the Lord your God, who has worked wonders for you. Never again will my people be shamed. Then you will know that I am in Israel. I am the Lord your God, and there is no other. Never again will people, especially my people, be shamed. And then I will pour out my spirit on all people, and your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men and women will see visions. Even on my servants before men, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. That is what some of the things we see happening to us now. <clears throat> Because the Father is pouring out His Spirit upon us, that we see and dream, that we understand in the middle of these crises what the Father is doing in and amongst us. So understand, <clears throat> excuse me, we've been looking at the prophets and how they speak to us today. So remember, prophets are sent to remind us of who God is, to call us to righteousness before Him, to call us to justice before Him. And then to show us how to walk in his way. And then next, they tell us what is going to happen both then and in the future. And Joel speaks these words so many years ago. And then Peter repeats them at the birth of, uh, birth of the church. And now these many two centuries later, we hear them again as they ring in our ears about what God is doing amongst us. Because the Father wants us to understand and know that we live with the certainty of hope that he is working and so as we've looked through these messages, series of messages, we've seen what the Father is doing. So today, we go to Joel to understand hope and to understand the Father's deliverance. Now Joel, <clears throat> excuse me, Joel goes to Israel. We don't know a whole lot about Joel. Joel just shows up and starts preaching. He starts preaching, but then he says, this is what is happening because the nation has been devastated. God has sent swarms of locusts, and they have eaten everything in sight. The plants, the trees, the shrubbery, everything. It just, whoosh, they're like a black cloud that comes out of the sky, and it's, whoosh, whoosh, and they just stay, and they eat everything, and when they're done, they just move on. He tells us this in chapter 1. He says, tell this to your sons. Tell this to your fathers. Has anything like this happened in your lifetime or theirs? Tell them. Why? Because I want you to pay attention. This devastation has happened. But blow the trumpet in Zion. That's one of his favorite lines. He uses it twice in his book. Blow the trumpet in Zion. In other words, pay attention. Because this is what God says I'm going to do. Yes, the locusts have come and they have eaten and they continue to eat up everything there. It came like an, uh, like an army. Joel 1 4 says this. And when the gnawing locust has left, the swarming locust has eaten. And what the swarming locust has left, the creeping locust has eaten. And what is the creeping locust has left, 
the stripping locust is eaten. Four different swarms. This comes right in. So the nation is in trouble. They're in turmoil. There's nothing left. That sound familiar? Here's, here's, our, here's our day to day. We live under the, under the issue of a worldwide pandemic, COVID-19. We have the stressors of that weighing down upon us. Over 200,000 deaths here in the United States alone. Over 300,000, 3,627,000 you know, people have been affected worldwide. I'm sorry, that's, that's something else. I gave you the wrong number there. I apologize. We live with social distancing. We wear it with one of these in our hip pocket in our car all the time. If you don't have your mask on when you go outside, shame on you. Because this is to protect us. This doesn't mean that you're a Republican or a Democrat. No, it means that you're trying not only to take care of yourself, but you're trying to take care of your neighbor as well. So you, we wear masks. We're not sure if this thing is ever going to end. And then remember, all we're doing is social distancing here. We've experienced in California alone this year 7,982 fires. 3,627,000 acres have been burned. We woke up two weeks ago with smoke just spilling the air. It's all over our cars. It's all over. It's like the locusts are going and eating everything. And then don't forget, our friends who live down in the Gulf Coast, the Gulf Coast, they've had to endure four, four tropical storms in two months. And then came Hurricane Laura. Hurricane Laura wasn't even finished yet. And then came Marco. Marco was just about done. And then came Sally, and Sally is there doing what Sally does, really slow moving, and then suddenly Beta came. Think of all these stressors. Then you have the issues of global warming, and the Greenland ice shelf is beginning to, 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 to shear off. Our state, like several, seven other western states, are in a drought. We think we have plenty of water. We don't. And then back to locusts. The 17-year seven year locusts are eating up North Carolina and, and the Virginias. You should hear that noise in that desiccator. And people are afraid. Is, are, is God trying to sell us something? tell us something? I'll bet he is. Because we are people in crises. Then you add on to that all of the political things are going on. Then you add on to that all of the economic things that are going on. And you say, is there any hope? And the answer is, yes, there is. Because we are people in crises. And Joel is speaking to a people in crises. Because the crises keep coming. What do we do about them? Well, he tells us a couple things. But the first thing is, I'm going to run through a bunch of questions. And as I run through these questions, don't go, oh, man, will you please stop? No, don't do that. Here we go. We start asking the why and when questions. Why is this happening? Why now? Why this way? And then the ultimate why question is, why me and why not them? We like to whine. But the whole idea here is, with the question of why, is that we need to be paying attention to what God is doing in and amongst us. That is what Joel, Joel is trying to drive home this point in his entire three chapters. And then there's the when question. When will it stop? When will I get my life back? When will I be able to go and see my friends again? When will I be able to stop social distancing? When can, when can I go out for a good meal indoors? When can I hug my children? When can I go see my grandparents? When can I go see my kids and hug them without fear? When can I come to church again? All of these why and when questions, they keep eating at us because we're impatient people. These are questions we all ask. And they're good questions. Because what they do is they speak to our humanness. They speak to our fears. They speak to our anxieties. Because we all want to go back to the norms that we used to have. If you're asking that question, it doesn't mean that you don't have faith. I ask those same questions. Where, when, why, how come, why me, why not, you know, all of that. And then those, they're the, those folks who, have, who are the victims of COVID-19 and who've had family members die, and they go, they have survivor guilt. 
I go, why is this? These are all questions. They make you normal. So if you ask these questions, realize that you're normal. It doesn't mean you don't trust God. It just means you're normal because God has made us normal people. But then Joel helps us. He helps us in two ways. The first one is, he says, we need to, how to learn from living with calamity and, and, and calamity in turbulent times. And so as you read through Joel, the first thing is, remember, that his favorite line is, blow the trumpet in Zion. Now why blow the trumpet in Zion? Because he's saying, pay attention. What's Zion? Zion is Jerusalem. Zion for us is our hearts. Blow the trumpet. Pay attention. So the first one is this one. Be open to what God is teaching you during this time. I talk to several friends, and sometimes, you know, people get a little, you know, they, they want to tell you what they're doing. That's fine. So people say, you know, I spend more time with God now than I ever did because I got time. Well, that makes sense. Some people say, my prayer life has changed. I get to speak with the Father, you know, and I don't have the rush, 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 rush that I used to. Well, that's good. Be open to what the Father is teaching you and how he's leading you. Now, don't run to your friends next door when you see them on Zoom or on Facebook or, or, uh, or, or Google Hangouts. Don't go, hey, what's God teaching you today? That's a process. I hate it when people, what's God teaching you today, Jer? I, I don't know. I talk with him every morning. I just follow where he leads me. Because he, as he teaches me, it's a process. So one, be open to what the Father is teaching you through prayer, through the Word, through the circumstances around you. Perhaps... The Father's teaching you to be more patient. Perhaps the Father's teaching you to be more communicative. Perhaps the Father's saying, hey, let me gather my family together. Let's pray together. Perhaps, listen. The second one is this. Learn, learn, learn the power of God and his provision. In chapters 1, 19 to 20, the Father says, yes, the locusts have come and eaten everything, but I am going to provide for you. One of the joys I have is every, every so often, I go into the office and I open up, open up a letter, actually, and as Susie's read them, I read them, and we get these big smiles separately, of course, two different days. We get, these, we get these big smiles on our face because people are saying, this is how God has provided for me through you, and we just, we just celebrate. Why? Because of what God is doing, because people are learning the power of God. God says, I sent the locust to help you understand me. That is hard. And so we're in all of these things that are going on, all the calamity around us, learn what the Father is saying. Maybe the Father wants you to be peaceful and learn peace in this time. Then the power of God. Lord, speak into my heart because, Father, I see you at work here, Lord, in the hurricanes. That's hard. All oh, the flooding, yes. But, Lord, you're still providing Understand, the Father's provision in these times, unexpectedly. Then the next way to learn from calamity is what's your prayer life like? Like I said, several people say, you know what? I've been spending a lot more time with God in prayer. Well, that's good. Why? Because as we pray, we then walk in confidence and hope of what the Father is doing around us. Because when we walk outside the door, we are confronted with COVID-19, social distancing. We're confronted with the fears. Am I going to be hurt today? Am I going to get sick? Is this little cough that I have, is it COVID? Oh no, am I running a fever? Is it COVID? A friend of mine called me up a couple of weeks ago. He's freaking out because his son, his son had a fever. So we start praying. He says, then he remembered that when his son gets stressed, his son gets a fever. It turns out his son was stressed. The fever was just because he was under a lot of stress. And so understand, we have those fears. So our prayer life brings those things down. It helps us to be still before the Father, to walk in his confidence, for him to fill us with his peace. The next way to live and learn from calamity and turbulent times is to understand this simple principle. Because Joel, again, blow the trumpet in Zion. In other words, pay attention. Because then he says, blow the trumpet in Zion, proclaim a fast, and worship. What's he saying there? Come into God's presence. And that's the idea James tells us here. James says, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Amen. Wash your hands, you sinners. 
Purify your hearts, you double-minded. What is James saying there? Draw near to the Father. Because when we draw near to the Father, then we begin to understand calamity. We begin to understand the turbulent times. And we say, Father, you got this. I don't need to stress anymore. Lord, I can be still before you. Lord, I am afraid out there, but I know that if I'm walking with you, I have nothing to fear. Amen. Learning from calamity and turbulent times. What's the Father teaching you? Understand the power and the provision of the Father during times of turbulence and, and calamity. What's your prayer life? Lord, help me to have a conversation with you. I hear people going, I don't know if I have faith anymore. Well, the problem is you, you have faith. The issue here is as you have faith, then you need to make sure that you're talking with the Father. Because when you stop talking to the Father, what happens is calluses go over your heart and you stop listening. Your ears get stopped up and the Father's shouting, blowing a trumpet, saying, listen to me, I'm trying to get your attention. Because I want you to know that I am your God who saves you, who loves you, who walks with you. Draw near to him. Now, that's how to learn. Now, how to live. How to live in turbulent times. It's this way. First of all, you can't ignore it, but understand what's going on and where to focus your attention. Now, people say, ah, I don't want to watch the news anymore. I don't blame you. I don't want to watch the news either. Because you don't know what to believe, where to go. The key here is, we know the truth. The Father has given us the spirit of discernment. You can't ignore it. The ignoring it is nothing more than denial. And denial is a part of grief. And yes, we're still a nation in grief. But as we deny things, we try to ignore it, and maybe it'll go away. No. Don't live in a state of denial. In other, other words, Understand what is going on around you and how the Father then can speak into you. Lord, help me to understand the larger context of this. I mean, you know, is this the end of the world? I think we're, we're beginning there. Is this ever going to end? God's in control. That's above my pay grade. But if we're talking to him, if we're living here, we can't ignore what's going on. We know that the Father's in, in control. We cannot deny that. Because if we're denying the times, then ultimately we're going to deny the Father and his power, his sovereignty and authority. Then live with God's restoration. Live with God's restoration. Because restoration is remembering that he is constantly cheering for you. He is constantly leading you. Remember the songs we sang this morning? They're all there to remind us of our worship in, is in Christ alone. In him we have hope. He is our vision. He is our battle shield, our sword in the fight. He is our dignity. In the last six months, seven months, all of us have had our dignity questioned as people. Yet our dignity does not come just from who we are culturally. Our dignity, our identity comes from who we are in Jesus Christ. Live there because he is our dignity. He is the one who lives in us and lives out of us. He is our soul shelter. Amen. We depend upon his provision for us, the restoration of hope, yes. the restoration of courage, the restoration of relationships, the restoration of who we are in him. Hold on to the hope of restoration. Read chapter 2, 12 through 17, and you'll see what the Father says, I will restore this. Yes. Because everything is gone, the Father says, I will restore this. Amen. And then believe his promises. In a moment, we're going to talk about two major promises the Father gives us. But he says, look and look at the promises that I've given you in my word. Live there. Walk there. Why? Because God is faithful. We're going to close our sermon this morning with God. Great is thy faithfulness. Why? Because that is who God is. Because God delivers on his promises. He speaks into us each day the promises that he gives us. Because he knows that he is faithful. Because remember, we're reminded in Hebrews that God cannot, does not, will not lie. And because of that, then we can rely on his faithfulness, his promises. Then here's the fourth one about living in turbulent times. Because this is a hard one for us. The first three are easy. You know, the Father's provision and all of those things, those, those, are, those, those come naturally. Those are easy. We struggle there, but this is what we really struggle with. Joel says it here. He says this. Rend your heart, not your garments. 
Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in love, and he, re he relents from sending calamity. What's he saying to us? Surrender your heart. Several times in scripture, you'll see someone there in deep grief. They want to repent. They start tearing. No, I'm not going to tear my clothes. <laughs> they start tearing their clothes. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Oh, and they repent. They cover themselves with ashes and sackcloth. I said, I don't want to hear that mess. Rend your heart. Rend your heart. The Amplified Version says, Tear your heart in pieces in sorrow and condition, in contrition, not your garments. Now return in repentance. That means surrender. Where are you still struggling with the Father? Where do you need to repent in your life? Lord, speak into my heart. Lord, reveal these things that, Father, you may rend my heart. Because, Father, I am full of injustice. But, Lord, these are the days when you're calling for justice. These are the days you're calling for righteousness. Lord, in my life, show me those things. And then when the Father shows them to you, don't run from them. Rend my heart. Because here it is. When we return to them, the Father is gracious and compassionate. As he tells us in Psalms, as far as the east is from the west, so far he removes our sins from us. Why? Because he doesn't want us carrying those burdens around with us. He says, give them to me. Rend your heart. Give it to the Father. Because he is gracious and compassionate. His loving kindness, his mercies are there forever. Now, that's learning from. That's living with. Now, the next one is God's promises. Because the Father gives Joel and to us two major promises of restoration. And they're right there in verses 25, 28, and 29. He says this, I will make up for the years that the locusts have eaten. Another version says, I will restore what the locusts have taken away from you. I have several friends, I've quoted that verse to them, and fathers have used that verse in my own life, and I've watched it happen, where you are so devastated, things are bad, things are terrible, they're below terrible, they're beyond that. And you say, then that verse just pops in your mind. It did that for me one day, I told many of you this story. I'm driving up Market Street after a Young Life Club, and I am just devastated. I've taken all the kids home, and I'm like, God, what is going on here? And the Lord says, I will make up with the, for you what the locusts have eaten. And then he goes on, he says, the gnawing locusts, the, the feeding locusts, all the swarms of locusts, whatever kind of locusts comes, economic, political, uh, emotional, psychological, whatever kind of locusts have come and start gnawing away. I will rule them away and then I will re regrow in you the things that I desire there. I will regrow in you. I will restore to you what you've had. Think Job for a moment. Job had the worst lo locust storm in all of Scripture. And what does the Father do? He gives him more than he had before because Job rendered his heart. Job went to the Father and kept going before the Father. That's what we need to do because the Father promises us restoration. Remember, what the locusts have eaten, I will restore. What they have savaged, what they have killed, what they have fleeced, I will restore. That's God's promise to us, that this is not all there is. One day this pandemic will be over. One day the, the fires will be out. One day the hurricanes will slow down. The flood waters will recede. The Father says, I will restore. And so in the middle of these calamities, Father, where are you working? That, Father, I may join you, that I may see you there. That, Father, you can restore. Then, this promise, I will restore. And then he says, their dreams and visions. Listen to what God says. After this, I will pour out my spirit. That's it twice in these two verses. My spirit upon all mankind. I will pour out my spirit. And then your sons and daughters will prophesy. When your kids come home and go, we need to do this. And we need to be godly. And we need to, we need to pray more. We, listen. 
Because what they're doing is they're prophesying. The Father has placed his spirit in our children. Why? Because they're listening. They see it. They're afraid just like you are. Yet you speak Christ into them and they respond because you're raising godly children and they're going to prophesy. They're going to say, listen, this is what God is. This is what I see. Help me do it. Help me see what God is doing. What's going on? And then he says this. Your old men will dream dreams. Now, typically we think dreams back there. The Father says, no, I want you to dream dreams forward. What's it going to be like when we do righteousness? What's it going to be like when God restores what the locusts have eaten? What are the things we can do and do differently? How can we dream again? Several years ago, there was this whole 40-day journey piece on daring to dream again. Why? Because old men and women forget to dream. What are the possibilities forward? It's easy to look backwards. What are the possibilities forward. You'll dream dreams. Father, show me. Lord, give me dreams. Lord, give me visions to see what's going on. Because that's where the young men and women come in. The young men and women, they will see visions. Visions of things that can be. Why? Because they have the energy. They have the drive. They have the know-how to do this. Lord, let's go do this. Because the Father says, I'm pouring out my spirit on my people that my people can go out and spread the word because I'm giving them my spirit to speak into people's lives. I'm giving them my dreams. I'm giving them my visions. And as I give them my dreams, my visions, my prophecies, they go out and do them because I am going to fulfill my word in you. This day is upon us. When Peter said it, he was looking forward. When Joel said it, he was looking at his day and looking even further forward. We're here now. This day has come and is coming. Are you ready? Are you prepared for the Father to put his spirit in you, to release his spirit in you? Because the spirit is there. Are you ready for him to release the spirit and let you prophesy, to let you dream, to let you have visions, to let you do his work through him? Why? Because he says, I'm going to restore this turbulence, this calamity is there. And in the middle of that, I still want you to be my people because I'm releasing my spirit in you. Are you ready? Because these things are around us. Yet we as God's people get to have him pour his spirit out through us. Remember Ephesians? God is able to do exceedingly abundantly more than any of us can say, think, dream, or imagine according to his power that works within us. So as you reflect on this this week, and as you reflect on this next song, ask the Father to release his spirit in you. That you may see and dream dreams and prophesy. Because the Father is at work amongst us. Even while we're sheltering in place. Even while we're socially distant. Even while we're having worship like this. The Father is still there at work. Father God indeed. Thank you for Joel. Lord thank you for teaching us how to learn and live in turbulent times. Father help us to keep our focus on you. Jesus, guide us with your spirit. And then too, Father, use your Holy Spirit to recall these words to mind, your promises, how to live, how to learn in these calamities. Because, Father, we, this is the reality we live in. Yet, Lord, you know that reality. And so, Father, we give it to you. And then, Father, as we do this last song, remind us of your own faithfulness in our lives. These things, Lord Jesus, we pray in your holy, your mighty, your blessed name. Amen. 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 Please now, let's listen to...